to our Sunday worship service via YouTube, necessitated by the fact that COVID-19 prohibits us from coming together as a congregation. But we are praying fervently that that will end soon, for we miss assembling with you. Our order of service is going to be that Herschel McDonald will be leading our prayer, Dallas Hatton will be leading our songs, the scripture reading will be by Joe Sheets, the sermon will be about Minister Lindo uh, Mitchell, as well as Don uh, Carbon, I'm sorry, boy, yet, yeah. we'll do doing our communion, and then uh, the closing prayer will also be by Don Boyette. Yeah. Let us pray. Our Holy Father, we praise your name, and we see your hand in everything we see every day. Father, we know that you are God and that you are in control. And Father, we ask your blessing and ask you to continue to watch over us and care for us as you have. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation and the love that abides here. And Father, help us to grow in love every day. Help us to grow in knowledge and for our spirit to get stronger. Father, help us to increase in number, but to always increase in love. Father, we're mindful of those that are sick in our congregation. We ask that you touch them and heal them, especially be with them as we are sequestered from each other. And Father, we ask that you bless our country in this time of this terrible virus. And we ask that you Help us to overcome that. Father, help us to trust in you with all our heart and to not lean on our own understanding, but to trust in your love. Father, we're mindful of the things that are going on in our country politically. Father, guide our hands. Help us to use our minds and our hearts to vote the way you'd have us to vote. And Father, help our country to return to being a nation under God. Father, we ask that you guide our elders through this period of deciding when we can start coming back together. Father, help us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And Father, bless us as we do these programs, as we worship through the internet and help us to spread the gospel. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask that you be with us always as you promised. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first song this morning will be number 255. Number 255. Five, I am resolved. <clears throat> I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to 
Uh, it is a great encouragement to me to have people of faith come together, and I'm profoundly grateful for your presence. I, I recognize, as I've said, that this is exceedingly familiar ground, and I don't have anything new to reveal to you this morning, but I want you to bear in mind what an opportunity it is for us to reach out not only to our own well-established members, but beyond that, to people that are listening by chance who are not members of the Lord's Church. And there are very likely people hearing us right now who have not been blessed with the privilege of hearing these elementary matters thoroughly discussed. In fact, this passage is familiar across denominational lines, but uh, all of it is often not read. And so I want us to look at all of it, and we'll make some applications that I think will be evident to you. It'll be different than what a lot of you have grown up with and what a lot of you have heard. But I'm going to ask you to respond to what the Bible says and to hear with understanding what your Bible says and you get your scriptures and turn over to Acts chapter 2. And based on what's taught there, I would call upon you, I'll tell you now, to render obedience to those things. You know, here we have... God seen his plan unfold. And it has gone through a number of ages, many centuries have taken place, until the fullness of time was come when Jesus was born upon the earth. And it has been by a divine decree that he would, should be as he is. He lived a third of a century, walked among men, left us a perfect example that we should follow in his steps. Assured us that when we saw him, as we saw him, we were seeing the Father because they are of the same mind, of the same judgment, of the same disposition. And he conceded to come into this low land of trial and tears and give us the example that he did. After the tragic scene of the cross, he came forth, demonstrating his power over the power of death. And he brought life and immortality to light. And then, for the first time in the history of the world, there was a glad announcement made that the gospel is to be preached to every creature on the planet. Everyone. And think for a moment how simple that matter is, as planned by God, carried out by Christ, and revealed by the Holy Spirit. God drafted the plan of human redemption. And when all was completed in readiness, he transmitted this to his son with direct specifications to come to his footstool, the earth, and carry out that which the Father had planned. And then the Holy Spirit comes in with his part, his particular work, making known to man what God had planned and Jesus had executed. Hence, you have the three who are one. One in purpose, one in mind, one in disposition, one in mission. And of course you believe that God's plan was adequate for the purpose that it was created. What we need therefore is to study God's plan, Christ's execution, and the Holy Spirit's revelation. So when Christ gave the great worldwide commission to the apostles to teach all nations and to preach to every creature, he said to them, go to Jerusalem and wait there until you are endued with power from on high. Now why in the world would he say that? The need is acute. And people are dying. Why would he say that? Because the message that they are to deliver is fraught with such momentous importance, such immeasurable significance that he dared not leave that to unaided, unguarded, frail humans. He said, wait until the power comes upon you. And then it will not be you that speaks, but it will be the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. Therefore, wait in Jerusalem. With those instructions to Jerusalem, they went. And with them, in our mind's eye, we are today gathered in the ancient city of Jerusalem ready to witness the beginning of the execution 
of the Great Commission just recently received. And I propose then the following method of, of studying this first recorded gospel sermon. I want to discover when it was given. I want to know about the character of the folks that were assembled to hear it. I want to consider who the preacher was in that day and at that specific hour. And next we will analyze what he had to say and then observe what the result was as he said it or as he finished his sermon and observe the further results that are still reverberating across the history of the world. When was the first gospel sermon delivered to man? The record says in Acts chapter 2 when the day of Pentecost was fully come. That's the time. This is the first Pentecost subsequent to or after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The very first time that the gospel is preached in the name of our risen Lord. And Bible students remember that Pentecost was one of three annual feast days that every good Jew observed. And that it was always on the first day of the week. There never was a Pentecost on a Monday or a Thursday or any other day but the first day that we've come to call Sunday. This Pentecost especially was a time when many, many ancient prophecies are coming to fruition. They're being fulfilled. And the inauguration of, of momentous things are coming to pass. It is the day when God's Spirit was to come. It is the time when Jesus is to be crowned at God's right hand. It is the time when the administration of our Lord is to begin on the earth. And it is the time when the church of our Lord, of the kingdom of God, is established on the earth. So it is a wonderfully memorable occasion, a beautiful time. And so we are at Jerusalem. We're at Jerusalem according to God's announcement. It's on the first day of the week, and it is around 9 o'clock in the morning. What kind of audience would come together in that place at that time? The Bible says there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Uh, many read that, frankly, carelessly. And it doesn't make very much of an impression upon them at all, but I want, I want us to notice it. You know, where did you ever see or hear of an audience like that old? You have likely been, many of you, in large crowds of people. We're near Houston, and they have a number of professional sports teams, and the people are interested in those pursuits, and many thousands prior to COVID-19 would come together on any given time. And then there are great universities in this state. Uh, Texas A&M, uh, University of Texas, of course they debate about that, but Baylor, there are a number of them. And they all have various teams. And people come together by the multiplied thousands. But this, this is different. Uh, you've been in some big crowds probably. But I would dare say that most people have not ever been in a crowd like this crowd. Where well, there are devout men from everywhere in the known world representing every nation and they're there to attend this Jewish feast of Pentecost. I know brethren sometimes come through our fair city, and they're in the little town of Livingston, located on a couple of prominent highways, and they're faithful Christians, and so they'll stop in on other business, but they'll worship with us on the Lord's Day. We have that happen fairly often. But this wasn't the character of the audience that was assembled on that resurrection uh, first uh, Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus. They went to Jerusalem for the definitive, definite purpose of worshiping God. And so there are men devoted, and there are men there out of every nation. The writer of Acts, Dr. Luke, enumerates 15 different nationalities. And if you'll draw upon your memory of the map, maps at the back of your Bible, I assume you've looked at those. If you went to Sunday school in places like where I grew up, I know you looked at them. And so you remember those maps. And 
You go way up yonder northeast of the lands of the Bible, around the Caspian Sea. There, there were representatives from there. And there were representatives as you sweep on down towards the Persian Gulf, go up the Tigris, Euphrates River. You find men there from all those regions passing across the great wilderness wandering into the continent of Africa. You'll observe representatives from what we uh, know as Libya, parts of Libya and Cyrene. And on west, as far as Rome, there were strangers, Jews, proselytes, come together to worship God. That's one of the most wonderful audiences I've ever heard of. And it's so fitting that they would come together like that because you will remember when Jesus gave the Great Commission, He said, go to all the world and preach the gospel. And then He brought the world to Jerusalem so that they could commence. That's not by an accident. And so we have a fine audience to sing. Who's the preacher on that occasion? Or who's the one that's highlighted, at least in the text of Scripture? Well, it's Peter. And you naturally would center upon Peter. Well, why do you say you naturally center on Peter, preacher? Because Jesus said to him in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, that he was going to give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And it would be his responsibility to insert the key, turn it, fling open the door, and bid men to enter the kingdom of our Lord. Peter bore that promise. And so Peter is the preacher. And it is, I hasten to point out, not the Peter who wavered. It is not the Peter who followed the Lord afar off when he was arrested. And it's not the Peter who denied Christ Having previously boasted, well, these other guys might deny you, but I never will. It's not that Peter. It's not him. It is the Peter who is a new man. It is the Peter who is filled with the Spirit of God, who stood like a great stone wall with powers from on high, having been granted to him. It was not Peter's speaking. But it is the Holy Spirit himself using this good man as a medium through which to convey the truth of God that is to be proclaimed. That's the preacher on this occasion. And having noted that he has but recently been empowered by the Holy Spirit, that gives weight to his words, ladies and gentlemen. Great weight. And I want us to enter into the consideration of his sermon. With that in mind, because people today are very fond of, of saying, well, that's your opinion. That's just your interpretation. That's just this, just that. This, is, this man is moved by the Holy Spirit. What he said is protected by God himself. Let's look. And remember also that before Peter could gain their attention and begin to uh, uh, make the address that he's prepared to make, uh, there were some difficulties that arose that had to be dealt with. When the noise of the coming of the Spirit, coming from heaven, when that sounded and it filled the house wherein they were sitting and cloven tongues like fire sat upon them that began to speak with other tongues, it left people in a state of confusion. Look at verses 13 and 14 of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says that the multitude came together and were confounded. What does that mean? What? They marvel. They're amazed. They are in doubt, saying to one another, what in the world does all of this mean? How is this, to, how is this taking place? Are they here listening. How is it that we're all listening to them, every one of us, in our own language? Well, to them, that was a real problem. It presented a, a grave difficulty. And they understood it not. Therefore, they were bothered, confounded, confused, amazed, and wondered, how, and how could these things be? But did you ever know in any crowd of folks, there's always some genius. We got geniuses all around. And they can always explain anything, whether you ask them to or not. And so, some such person said, I know what it is. These guys are drunk. Well, what an observation. These men are drunk. They are filled with new wine. And for that reason, all of this amazement and confusion, that's, that's their argument, Acts 2.13. 
And Peter got their ear by lifting up his voice. And he said, you men of Israel, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Uh, you just mistake it. Well, why? Why? Is what's in everybody's mind. Why are they drunk? Well, it's but the third hour of the day. Now, that's Peter's explanation in relation to the charge that the men are drunk. It's but the third hour of the day. I don't know that I understand all about that. I don't know whether it was contrary to custom to get drunk before nine in the morning or if it was some other explanation that, that was due. I know that they've got some stuff floating around in Livingston, Texas that gets you drunk before nine o'clock. But be that as it may, Peter's statement was perfectly satisfactory to that crowd of folks. They were confused and disturbed. They're not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And so Peter appealed to them subsequent to that, because he didn't argue that anymore. They were satisfied. Why keep on? He appealed to them then through their Old Testament scriptures that they are forced to believe. There's a lot of places he could have gone, but where he did go was to the Bible they then had. They aren't drunk, but this is the fulfillment of that which was spoken by our prophet. Peter's a Jew, they're Jews. This is the fulfillment of what was spoken by our prophet, Joel, verse 16. And namely, what Joel said was, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. That's verses 17 through 21 of Acts 2. That's what his prophecy was. So while Peter unfolded Joel's prophecy, the audience gained their, their reason, their mental equilibrium, and soon they're ready to hear further what Brother Peter's got to say. And so he begins in verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, and you yourselves know it. Now, that's pretty conclusive. It's a rather a lengthy statement, but it is a statement really of four, four propositions. What's the first one? You know, you people know, Jesus of Nazareth is a God-approved man. And the proof is in the performance of great signs, wonders, and miracles that he's done before your eyes, and you know it. Peter never referred to that again. He simply stated the proposition. He clinched this proposition with, you know it. So he goes on. What's the second? Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Verse 23. That's Peter's second proposition. All of this is according, all of this you've seen is according to the foreknowledge of God. And our Jewish scriptures abound in statements to that one effect that God has foreordained and according to his foreknowledge, Jesus was thus to be. They've read those scriptures. He's calling them to their mind. What's the third proposition? Here it goes. You have taken by wicked hands and have crucified and slain. Now most uh, preachers and pulpiteers today are not quite that direct and plain, particularly the first time they've talked to somebody. But Peter's there on a mission. And these needs are acute. And so, this is what you did. Do you think that needed any argument? Well, of course not. These very people that he's looking at, these very devout religious people, are a little more than 50 days away from having seen Jesus on the cross, many of them. And among that crowd are those who said to Governor Pilate, crucify him, crucify him, away with him. And so that didn't need any argument. Nobody on earth knew, but the nut group did, the truth of Peter's words. Well, what's his next statement? God hath raised him from the dead. It was not possible that death should hold him. So here we have a, a model sermon out. Initially, you've got an introduction, including clearing away all misunderstanding. And he prepares the audience for the reception of more sober, more solemn declarations. And then step by step, there's this statement of four propositions. And let's be sure 
that we give it. First, Jesus of Nazareth, who went among you, is approved by God, having done great signs and wonders and miracles in your province, uh, uh, presence, in your province, and you know that. Next, he delivered according to the foreknowledge of God, or he was delivered according to the foreknowledge of God. And he says, you crucified him by wicked hands, and they're now dripping in the innocent blood of the Son of the very God, and God raised him from the dead. Now, I think we ought to get some lessons from that, practical lessons. Now, sometimes preachers are in the habit of stating a truth that everybody knows. That nobody's disputed, nobody's denied it, and yet they'll go on and argue that for 15 minutes. Peter didn't do that. Peter never argued the fact that Jesus is God approved by signs, wonders, and miracles, and you guys know it. He never argued that again. The next point is that you have crucified him by the hand of lost men. Well, why talk? 15 more minutes on that. Anybody deny that fact? Anybody deny, deny, uh, doubt that fact? See, nobody knew it any better than that crowd, so Peter passed on and said, God has raised him from the dead. That's the only point among the four points that Peter made that need any support at all. That's the only point that the audience denied. They are bound to accept three of the propositions that he has shared with them. And hence, he doesn't spend one bit of time arguing matters of that sort, but he devotes his time to the proposition that needs support, that needs defense, and that is the resurrection from the dead. May I submit to you that Peter adduced three arguments in behalf of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And here they are. I read from Acts the second chapter, verse 24, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, note how skillfully accurate uh, Peter's argument is. He goes right back to the crowd's own prophet, their own man, David, a man that they recognize, a man in whom they have confidence. A man whose testimony they must accept. Peter said, you killed Christ. God has raised him from the dead. You deny it. But that is the thing that I'm going to prove to you. And I'll commence with your own prophet David. And so you hear him in verse 25. David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. Thou hast made him known to me. Or made known to me rather the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. That's what David said. David said that and they know it. He said somebody was going to die. But that person was not going to be left. Their soul was not going to be left in the Hadean realm. And he goes on to say, nor would his flesh see corruption. Now they are bound to admit that David said that. They all know David said that. So watch Peter's comment in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried and his sepulchre, which means his crypt, his tomb, is with us to this day. And we don't know where that is now, but I think it's quite possible that Peter knew where it was and pointed at it. We know where it is. He's dead and gone. David, therefore, being a prophet, verse 30, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flag, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. And you go on down to verse 31, he's seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Verse 31, Christ's soul, David said, was not left in Hades, or not to be. And the body of Christ did not see corruption. 
That's Peter's argument. And he says to them, in essence, if you will accept your own David and admit the resurrection, in fact, if you will accept your own David, you must admit the resurrection. For he himself prophesied this very thing. David said somebody would not be left in Hades and his flesh would not see corruption. He wasn't talking about himself because David uh, was dead and gone and there's his tomb. And David knew that God had sworn to him with an oath that of the fruit of his loins, one of his descendants would rise up and would sit upon his throne and therefore seeing this before, he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, Christ's soul, was not left in the Hadean realm. Christ's soul did not see corruption. His body did not see corruption. But God raised him up. For what purpose? Why? That he might sit on David's throne. Now that's Peter's argument thus far. He presents another. And here it is. This Jesus hath God raised up. Well, what proof is, is there of that, Peter? Wherefore, we are all witnesses. Now, I want you to see what an array of testimony that this statement includes. The audience must say either all of you 12 apostles and you 120 disciples are a bunch of liars, or they've got to accept the statement as given. So that's argument number two. Watch number three, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. Hence the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with its like demonstration is the third argument in behalf of the resurrection. I submit to you again the four statements of Peter's sermon. Jesus is a God-approved man among you by signs, wonders, and miracles. He delivered you by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You have crucified him, and God hath raised him up from the dead. What is the evidence of the resurrection? Well, the evidence is David's own testimony that when he prophesied not regarding himself, for there is his body dead, there he lies. But he's talking about Christ. Secondly, all of us in the apostolic company, we all testify to it. We've seen it. And these disciples have seen it. And thirdly, look at these wonderful demonstrations. You've heard people speak in your tongue. People unschooled them. You've seen signs and wonders and are seeing them. Look at all of that. Folks, that's the sermon. What effect did the sermon have? Verse 36. And when they heard this, this what? This climax of Peter's sermon, what is it? That God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, Peter, what's been your procedure? I've stated matters fundamental, three of which you do not doubt. The fourth I have produced evidence to support. Hence, I want you to know that God has made that very Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Well, what was the effect? How did they respond? Verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Conviction was brought to them. They were affected, deeply affected, by the proclamation of the gospel of God's Son. There was God's sword of the Spirit bringing conviction of their guilt. Therefore, they cried out to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? Now, let's just see these things as they are. What has been the program? First, Peter has preached to these fellow Jews. Secondly, the multitude has heard with understanding. And thirdly, they've been convinced, they've been brought uh, to realization and expressed with their inquiry, what shall we do? Were they believers or unbelievers? Were they believers or infidels? And to ask is to answer, obviously, they are believers. Where did you ever see a group of unbelievers cut to the heart by the preaching of God's Word. I'll tell you where you saw it. You didn't see it anywhere. Where did you ever see unbelievers crying out, men and brethren, what should we do? You didn't. You didn't see that. If Peter had subscribed to what a lot of our friends in denominational churches preach, 
He might have said something like, fellas, there's not anything that you can do because all of this has been fixed from the foundation of the world and the number to be saved has been definitely settled. And so you're either in or out. Or he might have had, uh, said something like, well, if you believe what I've preached up to this point, that you're already saved and there's nothing you can do about it, man is justified by faith only and that's a very wholesome doctrine. But you know that Peter didn't subscribe to anything like that. He never said anything that sounded like that. I want you to see it. Because these are sacred and serious matters that have come before us this day. Those Jews heard the gospel as preached by Peter, and the effect of it was that they were cut to their heart. It brought conviction to them. It stirred them up. It made them conscious of their guilt. Because they were made to believe that their hands were stained in the innocent blood of the Son of God because they were. Therefore they cried, Brothers, what should we do? Now watch it. Verse 38. Look at your own Bible. Don't ask your preacher. Don't ask any of your relatives. Look at your own Bible. You can read your Bible. God wants you to read your Bible. Jesus wants you to read your Bible. Because he said, the words I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. But just now. Let's go to verse 38 of Acts 2. They said, what should we do? Then Peter, speaking by God's Spirit, said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I want to ask you, is that perfectly clear? And is that easy to understand? Well, you know it is. Is there any difficulty about that whatsoever? None. Can the man responsible to God misunderstand that? No. What's the program? First, preaches the gospel to them. They heard it. As a result of hearing the gospel, faith was there. And due to that faith, they made the move and cried out, What can we do? Do for what? Do to rid ourselves of the horrible crime that you have charged upon us of killing the Son of the very God. What can we do about it? And God's Spirit speaking through Peter said to that assembly of believers, Repent and be baptized. It is strange to me, after 40 years of trying to preach, more than 40 years, it is strange to me that folks will resent a matter of this kind. But many do. A, a great many preachers with high-sounding titles and terms attached to their names, all kinds of initials when they sign something, would not tell an audience just what Peter told that multitude on that most memorable Pentecost. They wouldn't even read it to you as I've read it to you. And so I ask you, are you here in this audience? And I'm talking to those that are out there on the net. Are you in the audience having heard the gospel, believing you've heard the gospel of God's Son? And if you do, do you believe in the Lord with all of your heart? And if so, are you anxious about your eternal destiny, about your welfare? And if you are, and you want to go to heaven when you die, Peter said, repent and be baptized. Do what? Two things. Repent and, and what does and mean? And means in addition to, plus something. Repent plus be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Why, Peter? For the remission of sins. Well, who are you to tell me that? Well, I'm a man moved by the Holy Spirit. That's who I am. Why repent? For the remission of sins. Why be baptized? For the remission of sins. That's God's word about it. Now someone says to me, well, my brother went to war, wait a minute, that's just your opinion. That's just your personal view of it. And I must say, with all due respect, no, sir, that is not my opinion. That's what the Lord God said. And that's not nearly what he said. It's not just about what he said. It is exactly what he said. And everybody that's hearing me this morning knows that's what he said. So it's not a question of understanding. It is, ladies and gentlemen, a question of whether or not you and I believe what God said and are willing to take Him at His word and do what He requires and then trust Him to fulfill His promises. That's the story. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, what, was, what further effect was there of Peter's sermon? They on that Pentecost day that received God's word were baptized and the same day 
there were added or put together about 3,000 souls. That's verse 41. Who did that? The Lord did that, verse 47. Then the Lord added to the church that is such as should be saved. Now that's the system. And I'm hoping that someone this day, as we offer the invitation, that some honest person will gladly duplicate the experience of these folks on Pentecost and rush into the outstretched arms of the Christ who said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you believe the story? If so, why do you linger? Render that obedience that is demanded by the Lord. Don't let the devil scare you. Don't let pride hinder you. Come to Christ. Come now. Come. Nothing doubt. Won't you please come while you have time? May God bless you and yours. To help to prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 452, number 452, Night with Evan Penny. Night with Evan Penny.
this time we'll pray for the cook. Father, again, we approach your throne. Thankful for this occasion that we're commemorating this morning, Father, that Jesus willingly gave himself. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that he shed on that cross, may we remember that awful scene and partake in a way well-pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. It's normally at this time that we give the opportunity to give of our means as we've been prospered. Since we're not meeting together at this time, we would ask you to send your contributions to our post office box here, post office box 411 Livingston, Texas, or drop it by the church office when you have opportunity. Would you pray with me as we dismiss this service, please? Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have through this electronic medium, Father, to gather together, to sing songs of praise, to offer up prayers, to hear a message from your word, Father, to commune with you, Father. We pray, Father, that we will soon be together again, that we will be able to meet with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we pray that you will be with us, help us to be good examples. Father, help us to study your word. Help us, Father, to take opportunity, to take, partake of the opportunities that we have, Father, to, to help others, to teach others. Help us to be good servants in your kingdom, Father. Father, we know that sometimes we fail to do the things you'd have us to do, and we pray that as we commit those sins that we will repent of those things and try to move, remove them from our lives, Father, and pray that you'll forgive us of those sins. Father, we ask you to be with each of us, watch over us, keep us safe, be with those that are sick, Father, be with those that are suffering, and help us, Father, soon to meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.